Hello. Uh, my name is Judy Rutenberg. I'm the Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries, and I represent ARL as a SCOS board member. ARL is based in Washington, DC, and SCOS, the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, is an international endeavor. Next slide. I want to begin today with an acknowledgement that ARL is based on the unceded and traditional land of Indigenous peoples. We honor these people, especially the Nakanshtok, Piscataway, and Pamunkey peoples, who were displaced from their homes through systemic oppression and settler colonialism. We honor these lands and, and their original stewards, as well as the many Indigenous communities, past and present, including thousands of Indigenous people living in present day Washington, D.C. We have a global audience today, and I invite you to reflect on your relationship with the land from which you join us today. Next slide. I am very pleased to be here uh, with a fantastic group of colleagues, our co-sponsors at the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, Carl, the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, SCOS staff, and the three open science infrastructures we're here to get to know better. Dryad, La Referencia, and ROAR, the Research Organization Registry. We're going to close with a few questions to SCOS board members and CRKN leaders about process, selection, and getting involved, and with questions from all of you. I'm also pleased to be here with all of you. The audience today is largely uh, librarians from US and Canadian libraries and representatives from US consortia and from CRKN. Thank you for spending an hour with us learning more about SCOS, what it is, what it's accomplished since its formation in 2017, and its strategy, and for learning how these three critical open science infrastructures will benefit and thrive with your investment. We've all seen the momentum toward open scholarship grow in the last five to 10 years, um, in particular, with many organizations contributing to a vision of open scholarship published in and identified by open infrastructures, enabling librarians to better steward, preserve, and provide access to open content. There are many, many projects and products to serve this demand. SCOS is a global partnership operating alongside advocates, governments, and the research community, and it addresses one very important challenge for libraries. Where should we invest our resources that will make a difference and move us along the path toward open and equitable scholarly infrastructure? By rigorously vetting applicants for their importance to the research community internationally and their plans for financial sustainability, SCOS helps libraries and consortium make those decisions. This webinar has uh, Q&A uh, and chat enabled, and we will leave time for open Q&A at the end. And if you could show the next slide, um, it, this webinar is gov governed by ARL's Code of Conduct, um, displayed on the prior slide. Yeah, it's <laughs> displayed on the prior slide. Um, and with that, I am delighted to turn this over to Bianca Kramer from SCOS. Thanks a lot, uh, Judy, for this uh, for this introduction. And I think you already framed uh, what SCOS is, why what it's doing, and why it's important uh, quite well. I'll go a bit more into detail about uh, about those questions. And then that will be followed by um, the new the infrastructures in this fourth round presenting themselves. So, as you said, SCOS stands for the Global Sustainability Coalition for Open Science Services, and it was started in uh, 2017 to help sustain the infrastructure to support implementation of open science. What we've been seeing in this space is that many open infrastructures were and are created using short-term project money. And once that short-term project money runs out, it's often a challenge to remain sustainable. And also open access and open science infrastructure has grown in number and in usage, making that, uh, that funding even more difficult. And also many uh, infrastructures being funded by project money means that that's usually money for new developments and funding for operations is much harder uh, to sustainably 
have. What that means for sustainability is that many services with stagnation, downsizing, or paywalling, or even being acquired and then put behind a paywall. And that's a risk if we truly want an equitable and inclusive research ecosystem. And that's where SCOS uh, is trying to step in and play a role by providing a consolidated voice that vets open science infrastructures, not for profit infrastructures, and then recommending it for funding to libraries, institutions worldwide. And SCOS does that by assessing funding needs alerting those funding needs to the community, providing transparency on costs, also increasing efficiency for investors, and also really encouraging good governance from, uh, by infrastructures. It's important to emphasize that SCOS itself is not a subscri subscription or a payment agency. What SCOS does, SCOS invites uh, expression of interest from infrastructures, then uh, selects two or three infrastructure for a given funder cycle, and then works with consortia and institutional libraries to bring those infrastructures to their attention and invite the consortia and individual institutions to, uh, to pledge funding to those infrastructures. And those financial transactions are then carried out between the consortia and institutions and the individual infrastructures. So SCOS is not a central uh, payment agency but it does provide that vetting, it does provide that platform for infrastructures, and it also provides um, a community for both the infrastructures and the consortia and the library to have these conversations and to bring those two uh, parties together. So who is COS? COS is hosted by uh, South Europe and um, covered and steered by a number of, uh, of large organizations, among which ARL and uh, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries are two of them. But on the Scots board, there are representatives from a number of um, research libraries, associations, and other organizations around the globe. So really from, from all continents. And together, uh, they decide on the direction of SCOS um, and on the, uh, on the way SCOS, SCOS operates. And they also serve as a point of uh, outreach for consortia and institutions within their own countries, as evidenced by the organization of this webinar today. So, so far, um, through SCOS, over uh, four and a half million euros has been pledged to so far nine infrastructures by over 325 institutions in 24 countries. And this started with um, the infrastructures participating in the pilot cycle, Sherpa Romeo and uh, DOJ. Um, and of those, DOJ in their three-year cycle has reached the total amount of their target, and uh, Sherpa Romeo has reached well over half of that, of that, target, uh, that target. After this initial pilot cycle, the second cycle included three infrastructures, um, Directory of Open Access Books and uh, OAPEN, really uh, involved in uh, open access to, uh, to books, Open Citations, and uh, PKP, the Public Knowledge uh, Project. These two infrastructures are, as you can see, also well on their way to, to their targets with uh, Bain and OAPEN having already reached uh, their targets. Then the third funding cycle includes uh, Archive, uh, America, Vedalic from Latin America, and, uh, and DSpace that um, were selected uh, last year in last year's funding cycle and are currently really still in the middle of, uh, of collecting those, uh, those pledges towards their targets. So as you can see, this is a wide variety of, um, of research infrastructures. They're all concerned with furthering open access and open science uh, more broadly. And within this uh, group of infrastructures, we're very happy this year to welcome uh, the infrastructure selected for the fourth funding cycle, Dryad, La Referencia, and Roar. So there's also the ones that we'll be presenting to you uh, today. And they will tell a little bit about their infrastructure, 
uh, and their um, their goals with uh, the money they're trying to raise to SCOS. So for that, I'd like to hand over and first give the word to Sarah Lippincott from Dryad to tell us something about Dryad. Sarah, over to you. Thanks, Bianca. Dryad is an open international data publishing platform and community committed to the open availability and routine reuse of all research data. The open sharing of data underpinning research is essential to achieving the benefits of open science. It provides evidence to support research articles and enable experts to interrogate, validate, and build upon new findings, which is nothing short of critical in many domains. It allows researchers, including those from re less resourced institutions and regions, to work with data they might not be able to generate themselves. Next slide. These are among the many benefits of open data. And it's also true that emerging data publishing guidance set out by recent memo from the Office of Science and Technology Policy and the US National Institutes of Health make clear that academic institutions need to take urgent action on data stewardship to keep pace with evolving norms for scientific research. The NIH, for example, asserts that data shared in compliance with its policy should be of sufficient quality to validate and replicate research findings. Simply posting data online will not meet these new criteria. Next slide. This is one of the many reasons researchers around the world rely on Dryad and our fully curated publishing process to make their data discoverable and reusable now and into the future. Since our founding in 2008, we have curated and published nearly 50,000 data sets representing the work of nearly 200,000 researchers at nearly 70,000 institutions around the world. Our data sets are connected to research articles in over 1,200 leading academic journals. Next slide. Dryad publishes research data across domains and is a powerful conduit for data that doesn't have a home with a specialist repository. We publish only research data and work in collaboration with Zenodo to facilitate open publication of associated software and supplemental information, one of the many connections we maintain with other open source tools and organizations. Dryad's strengths are in the curation and standards-based open publication of research data, as well as in our collaborative approach and our community governance. Our curation process is best in class for generalist data publication. Our open source publishing platform represents the latest best practice for sharing data, connecting it to related research outputs and measuring impact. And our strategy for collaborating with other values aligned services rather than competing sets us apart. Next slide. Our team of curators reviews each data set for inclusion of required metadata that facilitates interoperability and they check that every data set may be opened with readily available software and that there is a readme file to guide future users seeking to build upon it. All of our data and metadata are permanently stored in our Core Trust SEAL certified repository, published under a Creative Commons public domain license and accessible via our open API. Next slide. We are supported um, in part by our uh, institutional and publisher membership program, representing over 100 research institutes, colleges, universities, government agencies, academic publishers, scholarly societies, and university presses who entrust thousands of their data sets to us each year. They're largely based in the United States, uh, and we count among our membership a, a number of ARL institutions, uh, ARL and CARL institutions. Next slide. We are a member-driven nonprofit, and we're proud to be one of the first adopters of the principles of open scholarly infrastructure. This means that we take seriously our commitments to responsive governance that provides accountability to our stakeholders, the long-term sustainability of our services and infrastructure, and ensuring the preservation of our data in the event that our operations cease. You can read our detailed self-evaluation on our blog. Dryad's revenue is generated from our core mission activities, curation, publication, and preservation of research data. This revenue comes from membership fees or from a data publishing charge at the point of data set publication. We're committed to building an exemplary data publishing service and community that is right-sized and low cost. It's our commitment to ensure that costs and services are appropriate for both the community and for Dryad's sustainability. And this is an ongoing process of generating sustaining revenue through a diversified funding model of data publishing charges and our memberships. Next slide. 
Institutions and specifically libraries across the US and Canada already invest in Dryad because we help them realize their open research strategy. We help them leverage the traction we have with research communities to promote open data publishing and best practices and to take the guesswork out of complying with funder policies. We are an established, reliable, outsourced and affordable solution that is nonprofit and community led. We complement local data management initiatives and can integrate with local data repositories. We actively engage and consult with our library community to co-create our services, features, and operations. Next slide. Our goals in the coming year are to drive adoption of data publishing, to grow our open global community, to offer a more nimble service model, and to support researcher needs and, and innovate. Next slide. An investment from your institution through SCOS will help Dryad resource more of our core functions so that we can navigate current demands and establish a strong position for the future. Specifically, we'll be able to invest in growth in outreach and promotion to interested investors, including potential future uh, ongoing members of Dryad, invigorate our core stakeholders through community engagement to encourage data, data publishing and, and, uh, and um, renewed investment, and to stay at the front of best practices for data sharing and building best practice for data reuse. SCOS's support will enable Dryad to invest aggressively in growing our community of support and responding to the increasing and changing demands of a highly competitive environment. Growing our membership and the annual contributions that sustain our services and infrastructure is critical. It will generate the momentum and ongoing financial support that we need to continue to grow uh, and to remain competitive as an open source community led partner. We're grateful to the, for the opportunity to work with SCOS funders to build a more open and equitable future for research data. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Sarah. Um, I'd also like to en uh, encourage everyone with questions for uh, Aarde for Dwyer or also for uh, Lara Francia and uh, Roar later on uh, to put them in the in the Q and A, and we will get to them after the after these presentations. So to continue, can I ask Lotaro uh, to, to tell us a little bit about La Referencia? Thank you very much, Bianca. I am Lautaro Ramatas. I'm the executive and technical director of La Referencia. La Referencia is the open science repository network of Latin America, and it's formed by the Association of Government Authorities of Science, Technology, and Innovation. It was funded like 10 years ago. Uh, initially, initially it was funded by a project by an inter-American bank a development bank uh, project, and later it became uh, an stable uh, initiative funded by Latin American governments. Uh, here you can see the the twelve governments that uh, the twelve countries that are actually uh, are now part of La Referencia, and we also work with Spain as an external country uh, associated to uh, to this group of Latin American countries. Because, because the, the language and the scientific culture tradition around uh, collaboration with Latin America. Uh, our mother institution is Red Clara, which is the regional uh, education and research network. Uh, so uh, Red Clara manage all the administrative and, and, and um, aspect of, of La Referencia for, for the countries. Next slide, please, Bianca. So uh, I, I would like to, to, to point to three aspects that I think that it's important to, to remark of, uh, uh, about La Referencia. The first is that La Referencia is not only a technical solution, but a platform for open science, but a political forum for discussion, uh, not only of, about technical issues, but political issues, uh, issues and agreements uh, between the Latin American governments and the external partners, so uh, it's 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 a common forum when, when where the different countries brings the uh, discussion like uh, open access uh, laws and agreements and and policies. Uh, the other aspect that I, I would like to to mention today is that we work uh, on the visibility of the contents 
produced by uh, our scientific and technical institu institutions. Uh, we promote, uh, we aggregate the, the contents of the uh, funded by the public funds of the of the countries, uh, and we give visibility to to this content through national notes, uh, regional notes, and also we share our contents with other regions and other uh, aggregator projects like Open Air, Core, UK, uh, etc. And the third uh, aspect is that to do this visibility um, endeavor, we develop our own software, an open source platform that is available for everyone to use. It is installed in the, our 12 countries and in the central node. And also it's been used by other external countries like Portugal, Spain, and we are working with Africa, with African research networks in order to transfer the, the, the knowledge to use this software also to build uh, regional aggregators uh, in the African region. Next slide, please, uh, Bianca. So uh, regarding the our sustainable uh, plan, we, as I said, the, the La Referencia is mainly sustained by and fin financed by the annual contributions of the member countries. We have that stable uh, contribution that allows us to, to support the basic operation, the basic development and maintenance of our aggregation software, uh, some traveling for, for, for the different members of the council of the countries to, to meet once a year uh, for discussion and to, for planning of the, of the general strategy of La Referencia. But to move forward with the expansion of the services and to face the challenge that the open science landscape, landscape is, is showing in the, in the last years, mainly because the COVID, we, we think, we feel that we need, uh, we require an additional source of funding in order to develop uh, some innovative innovation and new new features uh, to provide our community. Next slide, please. Uh, Young. So, uh, what our our goals are our goals are with uh, with discuss funding. We are we have two main activities or projects to develop with this this uh, discuss process funding. One is this centralized and, and global persistent identifiers, identifier service based on blockchain. Why we are proposing this? Because we need uh, not only a persistent, but a unique or at least the duplicated identifier in order to build better uh, services, less research graph indicators, especially for research assessment, that is one of the challenges that we are seeing in the near future for, for the open science, science infrastructure. Uh, we have a lack of coverage in the, in the globe, not only in Latin America, but in the global South in, in general, because it's not always easy to the insti to institutions to, uh, uh, for the, co the cost of these uh, PAD services. Uh, and the, the fees and the annual cost for, for the institutions are, are high for, for some regions. So, so uh, and always we, we discovered that most of the persistent identifier services are based on centralized models, depending on, on agencies and uh, not all, we, we look for, we are looking for build uh, a public good service uh with a decentralized with a decentralized uh technology based in the blockchain technology uh we have a growing project of of a blockchain of a public blockchain uh, network in, in latin america and the idea is to to the idea of this of this project is to to use that 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 uh blockchain network in order to provide a public good service of PID for our institutions. So this is, we have already have a proof of concept of, of this, of this technology that is published in the, 
in that uh, Senodo uh, deposit that you can find uh, later. And we are planning to present some uh, results this year in the open repository, hopefully if, uh, if our presentation uh, became accepted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and the other service that needs something that we we have been working in the last years is uh, an usage and common usage statistic component and service for the global open science ecosystem. We have we already have uh, different open components in order to provide the collection of uh, usage events for repositories. Uh, from different DSpace versions, and we already have a production stage service for uh, Latin American repositories, national networks. Uh, we collect and aggregate statistics, usage statistics, and we provide some widgets and minimal uh, products. So the idea with this funding is to expand the, these components to uh, other initiatives because we feel that we need to have a common measurer, measurer, uh, measuring system and, and methodology, especially again for the use this as a income for, for an input, sorry, for, for research assessment indicators and so on. So uh, we hope that this process we discussed will bring us some funding for these two projects that I discusses. I will be happy to to answer question questions later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lotaro. And indeed, if you have any questions, uh, please put them in the in the Q and A and deal with them later. Um, and then finally, uh, Roar, Maria, can I give you the floor to tell us more about Roar? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Maria Gould, and I am the project lead for ROAR, the research organization registry. I'm also uh, based at California Digital Library, which is one of the operating organizations behind ROAR, and I'll explain what that means uh, in the course of my presentation. Really happy to be here and grateful to SCOS and to ARL and Carl and Sarah Kahn for organizing this today. And thanks to all of you for being here. So uh, ROAR is a global community-led registry of open persistent identifiers for research organizations. Now let's go to the next slide and I'll show you an example of what a registry record looks like uh, using the Carl ROAR record uh, and ID as an example. We have records uh, in the ROAR registry right now for more than 100,000 research organizations around the world. And some in the example here, this is just from the ROAR search interface that anyone can go to at roar.org slash search to look up. Each record consists of a unique ROAR ID shown in the upper left and an additional descriptive metadata to uh, support discovery and disambiguation that includes versions of an organization name uh, in different languages, shortened versions, etc. Uh, we also map to other identifiers uh, for that organization uh, to set up crosswalks uh, when they exist. So let's go to the next slide now. So um, the use case um, that ROAR was really developed to support um, was this use case around tracking research outputs by institutions. And I think many of you on the call today are familiar with the challenges and, and the needs of trying to keep track of institutions' research outputs and to be able to discover and report on research activities. And so this really depends on the ability to drill down at the institutional level and connect these research outputs to the institutions where they are affiliated. So next slide. And uh, the problem that comes up when with this work of tracking outputs is that it requires knowing what these affiliations are. And the problem with the way that affiliations are often presented, that they are not represented consistently because names can take different forms, they can change over time, et cetera, or these affiliation details may only be available in paid and paywalled commercial services, or in many cases, just simply not made available at all when research outputs are produced. Next slide. 
So ROAR aims to address this challenge by providing a unique and open identifier for research affiliations that can easily be linked uh, to research outputs uh, and researchers and provide more um, clean and consistent affiliation metadata that can flow through discovery systems and citation indexes. So showing on the slide here an example from um, Dryad, uh, part of the SCOS family as well, um, showing how Dryad collects ROAR IDs for researcher affiliations when they're submitting data sets, and then includes those ROAR IDs for the affiliations in the metadata that they deposit when a DOI is registered for that data set. And this makes the metadata openly available in any system that harvests DOI metadata. Next slide. So uh, if we think about an ideal research workflow in which ROAR can play a part, the ROAR ID really functions like this invisible piece of metadata that operates in the background wherever affiliation details are being collected, like for a manuscript uh, submission or data set submission. So a researcher can select an affiliation, the ID is collected in the background, the researcher doesn't even need to know what their ROAR ID is or that it's even being collected, and then uh, the ROAR ID is included in metadata for that research output that's made publicly and openly available for other systems to harvest and access. Next slide. So there are other types of organization identifiers that you might have heard of or might also be using. And so I just want to take a moment to clarify a few things about ROAR that make our approach unique. And so the first thing that I want to highlight is that ROAR is really aiming to provide a truly open uh, registry, uh, free and non-commercial service for identifying affiliations. And so that means that the ROAR data is available under a CC0 dedication. We have a public API, a public data dump that anyone or whoever they are, wherever they are, can access and use and integrate. Um, Sarah also mentioned the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, which Dryad has signed on to. And this is something that ROAR is also a signatory to in terms of uh, really making sure that our infrastructure um, is openly available in every way possible for the long term. The second thing uh, that makes ROAR distinct is that it's really specifically designed to be used with other identifiers and other open infrastructures. Uh, so it's you know, not meant to stand alone um, in a silo. It's an identifier that's meant to enrich other metadata and other infrastructures. So it's supported in, uh, in Crossref, it's supported in Datacite, it's supported in ORCID to provide this um, standard piece of metadata uh, that can be used to enrich our common understanding of, um, of you know, research networks and research insights. And uh, thirdly, another um, unique aspect of ROAR is that it's specifically focused on what we call the affiliation use case, um, this need to identify affiliations and to make connections between research organizations and the research outputs that they are affiliated with. And so um, this is something that you know means that ROAR is not meant to capture every single hierarchy within an organization. It's not um, focused on capturing legal entities. It's really about identifying affiliations and connecting them to research outputs and researchers so that we can um, better discover them and keep track of them. And lastly, ROAR is being developed as a community initiative. So this includes uh, the organizations that are operating it. CDL has partnered with Crossref and Datacite as co-governing organizations to lead ROAR. We all have a stake in it. Uh, and um, also community involvement in our advisory groups and our curation process in terms of um, strategic decisions, decisions about what's included in the registry, how our metadata is represented, et cetera. Next slide. Just want to close um, briefly to um, zoom out and highlight a few examples of ROAR playing out um, and how it can play out in the larger research context in the US and Canada. The first example I wanted to highlight is the OSTP memo that came out in August. Sarah also highlighted this. Um, and just the, the recommendations that were included in the OSTP memo about, about um, capturing and identifying if, um, researcher affiliations in publicly available metadata. And so this is um, precisely the kind of use case that is really set up to support, and I think we're going to see growing um, interest and awareness of this um, as we as time goes on. Next slide. And second example I wanted to highlight um, is a recent integration in the Federated Research Data Repository in Canada, um, which uh, really leveraged ROAR IDs um, in Dryad metadata. Again, I'm calling out Dryad. Um, as a key partner to make uh, available data sets by Canadian researchers in their public repository. And next slide. 
And so lastly, a little closer to home, just wanted to mention um, that we at CDL, um, as a key partner, uh, leading, leading the Rory Initiative, but also as a uh, major um, public institution in the United States are really paying attention to the importance of, uh, as Judy mentioned, how we're investing our funds and really thinking about investments in open infrastructure as a key part of our overall um, open access strategy. And so highlighting on the slide here, a blog post that we put out last summer um, talking about that strategy and how open infrastructure, um, including ROAR, really fits into that. Next slide. So this is a really critical moment for Aurora's growth. I just highlighted some examples of growing awareness of identifiers and open infrastructure in our research landscapes. We're also seeing um, major adoption of ROAR and major growth uh, right now. Our API is getting um, 13 million requests uh, a month um, thereabouts. And so we're really excited to be partnering with SCOS to scale our infrastructure at this critical time uh, to be able to support growing adoption, to be able to support uh, wide um, integrations across our research landscape so that ROAR IDs can populate everywhere so that everyone can use them and have better access to this crucial metadata about tracking outputs. So thank you for your support. Thanks a lot, Maria. And thank all three of you to, um, to really show us what your infrastructure is about. And I think what this really shows is also the diversity between you two, the three of you, in the different way you support really open science um, in different parts of the of the research cycle and really also how you interconnect and uh, and interoperate and i think that's really at the key of uh, why supporting open science infrastructures is is so important to support a vibrant ecosystem of open science infrastructure services what i would like to do now is uh, turn this into a bit more uh, of a discussion and therefore, I'll stop sharing screen. And perhaps start that discussion with uh, asking a question to the representative of the SCOS uh, board here today from ARL and from uh, CRL. And perhaps the first question is that, um, as we already discussed, one key aspect of what SCOS is doing is vetting infrastructures and selecting a limited number of infrastructures to present to, um, to the resource community um, to support. And my question is, how does vetting, how did that vetting exactly work? Each year, SCOS receives many applications. And how do you decide which infrastructures to include in the next SCOS letting round? And that's a question perhaps for Judy uh, from ARL and from, for Susan Hay from CRL, but maybe first to Judy. Yeah, thank you, Bianca. <clears throat> um, it's a great question. Um, and I want to just start off by congratulating the three infrastructures and all of the, all nine uh, infrastructures in the in the SCOS family of, um, of products, uh, because the process really is a quite a rigorous one. Um, and it really is the value proposition of SCOS. Um, and so how does it work? Um, SCOS, you you know, will have seen makes an open call for expressions of interest for open infrastructure services. Um, there is an advisory group that works with the board. So this is drawn from the member organizations. Um, and this group has strong policy, technical, financial um, capabilities. Um, they spend six to eight weeks evaluating applicants and selecting um, a, a maximum of six services to invite to advance to the next round, which is a formal application. Um, and at that point, there's a conversation, you know, with that short list, you know, between the board and uh, board board group and um, uh, and the infrastructures. But at the expression of interest stage, um, the advisory committee is asking questions like, you know, is the service um, uh, at least a five years, a few years old? Um, can it demonstrate a sustainability challenge? Um, is the service a nonprofit? Is it affiliated with or owned by a research or educational institution? Um, and then this is really important, and I think all of the infrastructures today did a, a beautiful job of demonstrating this. Are the services of international relevance and broadly relevant to more than one discipline? Um, because like I said in the intro, there are many, many products out there. So um, this is a critical piece of it. 
Um, so again, there's a, a short list inviting full applications, and um, this is a you know sort of uh, much richer and more involved application. And then the advisor, you know, then the advisory group at this stage is looking like um, the services value to stakeholder communities. So we've discussed today funders, um, universities, libraries, uh, the research community, research managers, repositories. Um, uh, looking at governance structure, costs, and sustainability measures, future plans, and how they fit in within, like we've been discussing, an open, sustainable, and fair landscape, sort of the interoperability. So I, I think I can't um, I can't emphasize enough this notion of importance to the research community, and I think that came up in all three presentations today. Um, you know, as a critical criteria, um, this you know for something that the research that the library community wants to support. Um, and as you've said, Bianca, and each has, has mentioned today, SCOS works with the selected services to promote this kind of crowdfunding from individual institutions and from consortia who make pledges toward, toward a target. And we've seen that, um, seen that data earlier in the presentation. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I think that's really elucidating, um, illuminating about the process. Following that process, then that resulted this year in these three specific infrastructures uh, being selected. Can you tell a bit more about why these three specifically? What was the strong points from these three specifically that uh, that led to them being selected? Yeah, absolutely. I think they each did a great job of showing that as well. So, I mean, these are projects with, you know, established and well-known infrastructures, um, these three, uh, high usage, um, and already making an important contribution to open science and open scholarship. Um, but I think that, um, you know, as uh, Maria and, and Sarah both hit on, in a moment of growing funder, growing, strengthening funder policies around data sharing, um, these notions of identification, um, uh, you know, um, interoperability, um, a strong alternative to commercial or paywalled services, um, the critical importance to researchers and funders um, and institutions, as all of those are uh, tracking, encouraging the production of and then tracking open research outputs. Um, La Referencia, I think, stands out as really a model um, for a different way um, to, uh, you know, a, a repository network that, um, you know, that I that I know the the, the world looks at um, as a as a kind of regional model. Great, thanks a lot. Um, and I also mentioned Susan Hay from uh, CIR ARL, who's also on the cost board. And uh, but then I I realized that uh, she did. She could not be here today, so it's uh, <laughs> that's why I asked you two questions uh, in succession. But I think doing a great job representing the Scots board. So that's from the selection part. And then once infrastructure has been have been selected, then of course is uh, they're put forward to institutions and consortia with a request to pledge funding to them. And as we've seen in the beginning, um, over the last funding cycles, over three hundred institutions have already pledged funding. Some do this individually, but it's also a very important role for library consortia to uh, organize that funding through a consortium. And one of the consortia who has been very generous in the past already in uh, funding in our circles is the Canadian Research Knowledge Network. So I would first of all like to acknowledge that and thank you for that. And also ask you um, if you can tell something, uh, the representative of CRKN, Craig Oswick, who's on this call, if you can tell us something about uh, the role of consortia in here, and what's the benefit of pledging funding to a consortium for you? Absolutely, I'd love to, Bianca. Thank you. Um, so for us here at CRKN, it made perfect sense for us to become involved um, with SCOS and in partnership with Carl. Um, they approached us um, at the beginning of the SCOS um, when SCOS first began. Um, as you, you may know or may not know that Carl has a, a, about 30 or some odd members uh, in Canada, academic institutions, uh, while CRKN has about 79. Um, so it made perfect sense for though, although Carl was on the SCOS board, they didn't have the full membership of the Canadian institutions uh, across the country here. Um, so we work collaboratively and closely with them and it made perfect sense for them to approach us to act as the administrative consortium for putting the SCOS offer out there to all the institutions across Canada 
um, collecting the funding from those institutions that commit to, and pledge to discuss services, and then also to redirect um, the, the, the pledge money to those services once we invoice the institutions and, and collect it from all of them. Um, so for us at the consortium here at CRCAN, this aligns very much closely with a lot of our own priorities and goals and objectives with respect to open access. We have many different avenues with which we, with, with which we try to support OA, um, and this one being spe specific to OA infrastructure services was one that just made perfect sense for us to, to assist with. So I think we're very proud to have collected, I think, over 700,000 euros to date with, for all the, the SCOS rounds that have um, under, been undertaken so far. And that's not counting round four that just launched, I think, a few weeks ago. So we're looking forward to continuing, continuing that and helping in any way we can. And I will say that um, all of the OA services have thus so far been very collaborative with us in terms of trying to map the SCOS funding tiers to our own particular uh, needs here in Canada. We have a specific way that we map our, our own organizations and institutions to a, a series of tiers. Um, so we've been able to work with the SCOS services in a lot of ways to more closely map the SCOS tiers to the CRCAN tiers, and it has worked really well so far. So if you're at a consortium elsewhere in the U.S. or internationally that you have specific needs that might need to be taken into account, um, I would certainly bring those to the conversation as well. Um, so thank you, and happy to answer any questions as well. Thanks, Greg, for that. I think it's also very clear from what you said that there are two benefits for uh, for consortial funding, both for the library consortia themselves, but also for the infrastructures um, in exactly like what you said, the conversations and the, the coming to an agreement and making sure this is uh, the most beneficial and most efficient for both partners. Perhaps I should elucidate that a little bit also for people in the audience who might not be that familiar with SCOS. Uh, if you go on the, if you are considering uh, pledging, if you go on the SCOS website, you can see for each of the selected uh, of the infrastructures participating in this funding round, they've got a prospectus outlining, um, well, their goals and also outlining the proposed uh, uh, tiring tier model, which is based on uh, size of institutions. Um, and that's the starting point. But as Craig said, there are always conversations to be had to make sure that that construction is uh, optimally suited to both the infrastructure and the, and the consortium. So I would really encourage uh, everyone in the audience to start those conversations uh, with the infrastructures and also with SCOS who can assist in that, in that conversation. I'm looking at the, at the Q&A and in the chat and I don't see any questions there which I'm sure doesn't mean that there are no questions, but uh, they're not put in there. So maybe I'll take this opportunity to uh, go back to, to the infrastructures. And you already talked uh, that a lot about your infrastructure and, uh, and your plans. Maybe specifically what made you apply to, uh, what made you decide to apply to, uh, to SCOS? Maybe Sarah from Bright? Sure, thank you. Um, I, I, so I mentioned a, a couple of reasons or alluded to a couple of reasons in my talk, but I think largely um, Dryad wants to be able to, to add momentum to our drive to grow our membership and grow that sustainable revenue that supports us each year and ensures that we can continue developing new features, improving our, our technical infrastructure, in improving our operations so that uh, again we can remain competitive uh, with with other uh, you know commercial data data repository platforms and, and with other providers um, and to continue to to make progress to better serve the research community in, to improve interoperability and and all of the um, the things that are core to our mission. Um, we also want to um, to be able to um, envision a future where maybe we can move away from individual data publication fees and, and a future where institutions are supporting um, on behalf of all authors uh, open deposit in in dryad I think that's in line with a lot of, of movement in the open access world in general uh, moving away from individual author fees and towards a model where um, where our services are available to any researcher regardless of their individual means and where we're relying on the larger um, institutional and funder community to support 
um, open data publishing um, as a, a public good and as uh, something that's as, that's critical to the research enterprise. Thanks a lot. And um, perhaps the same question to uh, to Lataro from La Referencia. What made you decide to uh, to apply this course? Yes, Bianca. As I as I said, um, we have our basic funding for for our basic operation provided by the government, but this is not enough for us to to face the challenge that we have as a as a community, as a region but also as a global ecosystem of open science. We, we see the, the research assessment challenge as one of the main goals for the next years. And for, for face that challenge, we need to develop a lot of technology that will be useful for Latin America, but we think that will be useful for other regions and to leverage the gaps between the regions also. So we are already collaborating with Africa, with Red League, with some intra and extra regional uh, initiatives. And we feel that, we think that this funding opportunity that SCOS is giving us is, is a tool for us to, to share all the experience, to bring more people work, to work in the technical challenge uh, and to share them the, the results with the global community of the open science. Thanks a lot, and thanks also for highlighting the importance of connecting uh, with different uh, with different regions. I think that's a really important point. Uh, finally, going to Maria with the same question. Sure, thanks. Uh, so, for Roar, I, what I'll say will echo what what Lautaro and and Sarah have touched on as well. But I, th I think for Roar, it really came down to a, a few different reasons why we. Uh, wanted to apply and uh, especially at, at this time uh, in Roar's growth. And, you know, one of those reasons is that Roar was designed and um, as a community initiative and continues to be run as a community initiative, it developed through uh, various collaborations and working groups involving up to 17 different organizations to really develop the vision for ROAR and how it would be operated. And so community funding and community investment in, in ROAR is, is really a key part of, of, of who we are. And so uh, being, being part of, of SCOS and the, and the SCOS family helps to, you know, helps to keep that, uh, keep that vision, um, you know, top of mind. Uh, another, another key reason is just to, you know, really to bring more awareness, um, like we're doing in this webinar about the, the importance of investing in, in open infrastructure. And one of the challenges that we face at Roar is that we don't charge anything <laughs> For anyone to uh, to use Roar, to integrate Roar, uh, to download our data and make various uses of it, uh, but it still costs money to to build Roar and uh, and to sustain it. And so I think there's there's we're definitely at a really key tipping point right now uh, in our um, in our space about um, raising awareness about the importance of making these investments. Um, not just it's not about Roar benefiting; it's about the, the collective benefit that those that these investments can make um and then the you know the third reason that's kind of closer um you know closer to what Roar is experiencing now is really just this particular moment of growth uh that that we are in uh, really needing to scale um as um, Sarah had touched on as Altaro has touched on that this is really a critical moment for getting additional investment in Roar so that we can keep up uh keep up with a growing demand uh, for the Roar API, as I mentioned, uh, to be able to scale our infrastructure, to be able to support those who are integrating and adopting Roar, again, so that everyone who has a stake in this kind of infrastructure can be better off. Thanks a lot, Maria. I think that beautifully illustrates uh, the importance of, uh, of these funding calls. We also have uh, two questions in uh, q and I think that are nice, uh, nice segue from the why to the how. Uh, one question from uh, Leslie Moore about uh, when institutions are granted SCOS funding, how long does the funding last? And Craig, I saw you already answered that question uh, in the Q&A, but perhaps uh, so everyone can hear and see it, you, would you mind uh, repeating that answer? 
on the call itself. Sure, and I apologize if I'm not understanding the question exactly right, but um, if the question is asking for how long are institutions pledging funding to the SCOS services, uh, it's typically for a three-year period. Um, that's what's recommended. But I did mention also that here at CRKN, we have accepted pledges of one or two years also if, if an institution does not have the funding to say, to commit uh, to a three-year pledge period. Thanks a lot. And perhaps Judy from the SCOS board, maybe you can elaborate on that and say something about the reason why this three-year period is sort of recommended. Um, I think these are, I mean, the three-year period is really the, it's, it's part of the part of the arrangement, the plan, you know, between SCOS and the infrastructures to achieve the goals, you know, the funding goals and sustainability goals that they have in mind. Yeah, exactly. And really also to, to try to have a little bit more longer term sustainable, sustainable funding. One other question from uh, Nick Helper. How does SCOS facilitate, if at all, connections between SCOS funded services? Does SCOS try to coordinate open science infrastructure that is interoperable with each other to help in coalition building? And if I may, I can try to answer that question uh, myself because we just had a meeting with all the SCOS infrastructure where we talked about, uh, among other things, exactly uh, this. So I think the answer is yes, that we will um, really make make good use of the fact that we now have acquired a wide, of, wide variety of infrastructures represented at SCOS. And one of the, the good things that we can do beyond just um, advocating and supporting longer term funding is really also advocate and support and help a vibrant ecosystem um, in itself. And that can include uh, exploring and um, increasing interoperability with these services. So it's not a prerequisite, but it's certainly something that uh, we hope to try and encourage and work on with these infrastructures. And then finally, and we're nearing the end, but there's a final question from, uh, from Ginny Steele. If SCOS continues for another decade or even longer, there could be 30 or more different platforms that have been funded. Has the SCOS board discussed a maximum desirable number of projects? Or will there come a time when SCOS encourages collaboration or consolidation of platforms to avoid a fragmented infrastructure environment? I think that's a very interesting question also relating to the strategy and future vision. So that's perhaps a very good question to end with. Uh, Judy, would you like to say something about this? Sure. Yeah, no, it is a great question. Um, you know, right now, SCOS has a strategy document. It's, you know, to 2025 is the current um, date of that of that document, um, which involves, you know, what it's promoting the sustainability of open science infrastructures, um, raising global awareness about the value of non-commercial open infrastructure through advocacy and connection building, to your last point. Um, and building and maintaining trust in open science infrastructure through this kind of vetting and selection. Um, so those are, but the question is a really good one. And I think it um, it is, uh, you know, part of how SCOS does, SCOS does what SCOS does. <laughs> it, vet, it vets and identifies um, good bets, good places, um, in, you know, infrastructures that are very important to the research community. Um, that are worthy of support that need that needs support to scale up and ramp up in the ways that we've heard today. Um, so I think um, it is a piece of a global conversation around exactly this question. Um, you know, it is it won't it won't on its own solve this issue of coherence or or um, or fragmentation, but it will be a but it will through fulfilling these goals of raising awareness, um, building out this funder base. Um, you know, promoting the SCOS family of, of, of um, infrastructures that collaborate with one another um, will be an important piece of, um, of mitigating exactly that, um, what, what Ginny raises as a, as a risk. Um, so I thank you for the question. Um, and with that, I think we are out of time. We are right at the hour mark. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone, all of our presenters, um, and for, and to, um, to the infrastructures, to our co-sponsors, um, and for all of you for tuning in um, today. Thank you.